All right, folks, you know what time it is. It's time for an ad for Overcast. Overcast is an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. As always, you can get it for free on the App Store. Page in my rhyme book, page in my rhyme book, page in my page in my page in my rhyme book. Hey. Hi. What's up? This is Ergo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm Damon. I'm Kiss. And we are here back doing what we do, showcasing the voices and particularly here the writers that are reshaping our culture of our city and world for the more equitable. And we are back in our notebook suite. Kiss, how you feeling? I'm doing all right. It's been a uh, an interesting start to the year. This is the first episode we actually recorded uh, this year. And I'm excited to get to share it with y'all. Yeah. So we're going to even peek behind the curtain a little bit of how this was produced. Uh, so we are in the middle of starting off this conversation um, and very on brand. Our guest had an important and, and where we got back fruitful call with a publisher. And when we rescheduled our time, we rescheduled it for the exact time <laughs> that Trump's base had scheduled their uprising or their little insurrection. <laughs> We had a scheduling conflict, yeah. <laughs> and so we felt it was a little heavy uh, to try to be talking through as that was happening in real time. So we we took a little break, took a little breath uh, in between the conversation, and came back a few days later and finished it off. Uh, and it was a privilege and, and a, a beautiful uh, reconnection with friend and loved one of the show and of the work, Jamila Lemieux. Jamila Lemieux is a writer, cultural critic, editor, and movement worker. She's been a steadfast and vibrant voice uh, on Twitter and in the pages of publications and magazines over the last for almost a decade now, building the public intellectualism around Black liberation and the lens of Black feminism in relation to pop culture and our larger communities. Before we hop into it, as is the case with all the episodes in this suite, we wanted to share a writing prompt that Jamila had given us. So the prompt for this one is super simple. Jamila said, do a, a free write, view the blank page as if it is your enemy and fill it with whatever comes. So kind of similar to how you sometimes you hear people talk about morning pages, but it's this idea of just whatever the words are that come to you, fill that page. And if you do it a few times and it becomes part of your practice, it might not all be things that you carry with you, but there will be some gems in there. So that's your exercise. Take a blank page, fill it up. So happy writing. And now let's get to our conversation as part of our notebook suite with Jamila Lemieux. Yeah. We are back at it in the notebook suite. Uh, we have amazing writer, journalist, media maker, uh superstar mommy <laughs> as well uh the one and only jamila lemieux is with us burr, 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 burr. Burr, burr, burr. thank you for having me thank you so Absolutely. much thank you so much so i i, I don't want to rush past our tradition we always ask this two-part question uh and it's around time and so in this time define time however you will this hour this day this season this lifetime in this time how is the world treating you and how are you treating the world? So I have to say the world is treating me very well right now. And I actually had a conversation with a friend uh, a little earlier about this very thing. And it's it's difficult to say that, right? Like he was like, yo, I had a good 2020, you know, for the most part. I will say overwhelmingly, the world is treating me well. Uh, and I think that is because I am... You know, I always rolled my eyes at, at people that were too love and light. And I don't think love and light applies for all situations. You know, like being a love and light person does not mean that you are shining love and light on everybody. I, I don't believe in loving enemies. You know, I understand that that's somebody else's, you know, ministry. Like, it's just not for me. <laughs> but I am operating from a place of abundance, you know, in, in the literal sense, right? Not just in the idea of, of having some abundance of money, but of having all of the things that I need and, and much of what I want of, of being fulfilled by experiences of having meaningful connections with people, talking to my ancestors, you know, just being really intentional in, in 
a lot of the ways that I move in the world and working on being more intentional in some of the other ways that, that I move in the world. Um, but I think that taking that step is, is why the world is treating me well. Um, and I feel that I am, you know, working to treat the world well. Uh, I've gotten good at knowing when I kind of need to be on my hermit shit. Mm. And I refocused and, and thought about like what I want to be in the world and what I want to do for the world. So I feel like I'm treating the world well. So we have a specific question to kind of ground us in, in these conversations in this this notebook suite that we're in. It's to ground us in talking about writing uh, because writing is a, a unique craft because unlike painting or, or even, you know, being a filmmaker, right? It's something that we all, not all, but many of us do in some type of way. Uh, but not all of us consider ourselves or move through the world as a writer. And so what we've been asking folks is your relationship between writing and when you saw yourself as a writer, was there a moment, was there a process, was there a period in your life where you started to identify with this craft and with this practice as a part of who you are and how you show up to the world? It took me a while. You know, I always had a talent for writing, especially relative to other subjects like <laughs> math and science, you know. And I, when I went to college, I majored in theater, kind of unexpectedly. I had done for Color Girls my senior year at Whitney Young. I the saw bug that. bit me hard. You did? I oh was my there. God. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You are a baby. Yeah. Wow. Damon, do you have yes. a re- do you have a review of the production? <laughs> oh, it was phenomenal. Man, Whitney Young Theater was the shit. I was, it was actually really good. when I was like in fourth grade, I was in one of the oh, wow. we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I was in one of the oh. AAC plays. I don't know if you remember. Were you? Were you in it? Oh my god. A sound oh. of our own. Do you remember that? That was after me. That was after you. I think okay. That was after me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. That's but, so dope. But shout out. <laughs> shout out <laughs> to the production. <laughs> Y'all yes. used the stage well from what I remember. <laughs> Thank you. The first time I engaged for Color Girls, I was in fifth grade in an oratory contest. I didn't do very well. Everybody else did. Like, I have a dream, you know, maybe an ain't I a woman. And I'm like, half notes scattered, no tune. You know, like, I didn't even understand all the words myself then. I was in fifth grade. But I was just, I've been drawn to that text many times in my life. I've been drawn to it again recently. But I, I got to school. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be a theater major and, I, and, and acting. I, I'm not playwriting, but acting. And my best friend who was like, you've always been a writer. Like, why are you running from this? And I was just like, you can't tell me what I'm uh. And like, you know, I wrote a few articles for the paper and, you know, I, I wrote for class, but it just wasn't a thing I went to do until my senior year, uh, 2000, who was a long time ago, 2005. Um, blogging was still very new. And I had these thoughts and feelings and I wanted to, you know, write them down and share them with people. And I just kind of on a whim started a blog and I had told my parents that I would teach, you know, because they freaked out. I'm a first generation college graduate. So like me getting to Howard was a big fucking deal, you know, like a lot of sacrifice, a lot of energy and attention went into that. And then I show up and they're like, and you going to go and declare something where you might never be able to pay a bill again in your life, you know? So we kind of had an unofficial agreement that I was not going to be a starving artist and I was going to figure, you know, that I'd be able to take care of myself and have some good health insurance. And so I, I worked in and around education a little bit, even before I graduated school. Um, and I had gotten it like I failed a class second semester senior year. I had gotten hired to teach language arts full time. Power University Middle School of Mathematics and Science. Failed a class. They allowed me to teach. You know, they were like, it's fine. What the principal did not know was that because of the no child left behind legislation that uh, President George W. Bush was responsible for, they had these really awful rules for public education. One of them, and I'm not saying that this is an awful one, but a teacher who was not accredited, the student's parents had to be notified. And so the principal now three months into the school year, I think it just kind of worked out. Like he chose to spare himself the embarrassment and just, you know, give me a little severance package and let me go. And so- During that period of time, I started the blog, you know, the beginning of my real senior year. It was around Hurricane Katrina. So I had some Mm. thoughts about that. And I had some kind of funny stuff that had happened, you know, that I'd written. So I was kind of doing humorous stuff. I was just writing. And now I have no job. And so I just started blogging. And some days I would do two or three posts. I just got really into it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be a writer. And I'd already decided I wanted to move to New York after graduation with no, like, you know, I decided that when I was 12, I was moving to Brooklyn. (laughs) Like I didn't, I never visited. I didn't visit till I was like 21. You know, I just knew that New York is where I was going to be. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to New York and be a writer. And it wasn't until, you know, I, I, 
I didn't really start allowing myself to identify as a writer until I had an audience. Mm. And it shouldn't be that way. Like, because I've done tons of writing in the last couple of years that I've not shared with people. Like, I haven't been publishing as much. And I've been intentional about that. And I'm like, I'm still a writer. Like, writers write. Like, that's what makes you a writer. <laughs> right. It's not that people have consumed it. But I think it was that moment where it's like, I've always been a writer. I just was the one in denial. Mm. Mm. Jumping ahead to, to that recent process of writing more uh, things that people don't see. What kind of initiated that shift for you of, of pulling some of the words inward and not letting them be as, as visible? So to give you the 60 second breakdown of my career, from that <laughs> blog, I, 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 I don't know, I can do this, I can do this. From that blog led to a career in media quite accidentally, which led to being a senior editor at Ebony Magazine. You know, I worked there for five years and, and was there during the beginning of the current racial justice movement. And so just a very exciting and you know, energizing and and deeply emotional and stressful time to be working in media, particularly black, you know, being a black person in media and being a black person in black media, which had very limited resources. So there were many days and nights that I was one person in Ferguson by herself who did not have a driver's license or camera crew or really or not enough money in the bank. If something that really went down and I needed some help, you know, I was just out there with a my phone, you know, I'm not a reporter, you know, so it's like, I don't know how the fuck, you know, it just, it just kind of happened, but like, I'm trying to do something in a way. I was always more of a citizen journalist than I was, but I had a mainstream, you know, granted a struggling black mainstream brand, an independent one, but you know, nonetheless, like I, I had this mainstream brand and this kind of indie journalist kind of shit happening. Hmm. And the reason that I was able to have the career that I have is because of social media, but Social media was supposed to be, for me at the beginning, a tool with which I used to share my writing, right? So I didn't join Twitter to tweet or right. to, to minister or to have friends or to, you know, meet my baby father, because that happened on there too. <laughs> um, but so shout out to Twitter, got me a baby, you know, but like... <laughs> somebody somebody but, did join Twitter for that reason. Many people Most have people. joined Twitter. Most people joined Twitter for that reason. Twitter joined Twitter for that reason. <laughs> right. They were not thinking Black Lives Matter. They were thinking people can hook up yeah. um, and make friends. But like... It's brought so much into my life, you know, people, resources, an audience, like I'm so grateful for it, but there's an instant gratification that you get from sharing a thought. And then there's the one you get from people engaging with it. And then there's the one you get from people telling you that it's smart. Right. And then there's also the the feeling that you get from people telling you that it's, that's not smart. That's not good. And that you're not smart. You're not good for having these ideas. Right. And so on one hand, Having people gas me up and, and like my ideas on Twitter made the labor of sitting down and writing an article a lot harder to get to because I can get that feeling right then and there. I have at this point, I have a job, you know, like, and so a lot of the things that should have been and could have been articles, poems, play, you know, just like writing, um, substantive writing. And I'm, that's not to say like, look, the, the stuff that we, the collective we have done on social media in the past decade has changed the world. And, and in many ways for the better. And, and so it's important that we're taught, like, you can't just hide your, your feminist shit in a book because not everybody's going to pick up a book. You know, like you got to find other ways to get this message out there. But if you're sitting around arguing with a bunch of people who do read books, maybe go write them a book, right? Or, or, if you, <laughs> or, or if you, maybe, you know, and like, um, I've been trying to write a book and sell a book, write and sell, sell a book, to write, finish a book proposal. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter, I have a seven year old. I've been trying to do this her entire life, essentially, you know? And, and when I say trying, there were definitely years where there was no real effort. And then there was time where there was effort. After I was an editor, I was an executive for two years, you know? So now I've got this good paying job and I'm, you know, not being paid with, you know, I'd be, I was at another black company. It was, so it's like, I, I wasn't balling out of control, but I was definitely more comfortable than I'd ever been. And I have a different workload. You know, and I just speak in engagement. So I would get to write speeches, but like the sitting down and writing an article, it just wasn't happening. And the book wasn't happening. And I became deeply depressed. I'm now, you know, when I was an editor, if I wasn't writing as much as I wanted to, I was still shaping other people's words. Right. Still you know, engaging was, with it in that way. Still yeah. engaging with it. On the executive level, it's a bit different. And there was a lot more time spent talking about ads and metrics and things. And when I, that's not who I am. I didn't know that I could step out into the world and freelance and, and make the same amount of money that I would make working for somebody else, that I could, that there was a way where I could breathe. 
Right. right. And that I could also write and create. So success was taking away writing from me. So it's like, so I'm successful at being a black middle class person. Like that was never my goal. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm touching people less. I'm not, you know, putting out this stuff I want to in the world. And the only way I know how to do it easily is social media. But I mean, what the fuck? Like they're, they're, that can only go but so far. And so um, I had an opportunity to leave that job, my last job in 2018. Uh, I took it and ran. So even then I thought, okay, I'm going to start a newsletter and I'm going to just publish and publish. And like, I had to reset. I was deeply depressed. Hmm. You know, and I don't think I realized how depressed I think. Oh, wager Damon. I wonder about this for you. Being black is traumatic. Being a marginalized person is traumatic. You know, most of us, even if you're relatively privileged, I'm privileged in a lot of ways. I have a lot of unique, weird privileges, right? Like I've never had a ton of money. I'm not from no money, but like I, I've had some fortunate circumstances in terms of luck that have allowed me to be comfortable in ways and in spaces that maybe other people might not have been. But even with as much reading as I know, nothing like people were shocked by Ferguson. I was, I'm from Chicago. I'm yeah. Midwestern <laughs> suburbs. Are, I, I know what a Midwestern suburb yeah. is. You know what I mean? Like, I know how those cops are. I know, you know, how the people are struggling. I know how the relationship is with the people at the at the Aki store. Like, I get all that. Like, none of that was new. It was new. A lot of people, that was a whole, like, wow, we thought this was the South. And just even how broken our relationship to the South is, right? That we would be like, this ain't the South. This is not supposed to happen. Like, oh, this is supposed to happen in the South. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an hour, but, um, an hour and a half from there in right, the expectation. Right? right. Yeah. Right. You know, and so it, I just think the constant, you know, social media having a lot to do with this, we're not meant to engage with the most traumatic parts of our experience on a 24 hour endless feedback loop. And so even as somebody who I don't watch the video and almost never watch the shooting videos, you know, I, I watched a few early on and I was like, oh, no, there are yeah. people who perhaps do need to be you know, subjected to informed, this horror, yeah. informed, right. you know, and those are the people that are the least likely to click on it. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and and I don't have to click on it. It's there. It, it's the image of Eric Garner. I've sat with Eric Garner's mother and, you know, Muhammad Ba's mother and held them while they cried, you know, and, and, and because I was trying to, you know, doing a video with it and just like, you feel powerless, right? A lot of this is just regurgitation in media, uh, in journalism. A lot of it is just simply just this happened and just kind of sitting in it. And I sat in it for a long time. And, and, and between that and just kind of, I think, the trolling and harassment that comes with being just even a speech visible, you know, on, as a woman on the internet, particularly a Black yeah. woman, particularly a Black feminist woman. Mm -hmm. And that being a particular kind of heartbreaking because I started, you know, it was like the calls coming from within the house. I was like, yo, it went from all of my trolls are white people to so all of my trolls are black men or pretending to be, you know? And I'm just like, Hey, you need to just go on and work on yourself for a minute. And so that's what I've been doing. And so it took me a while to start writing. Even after that, I thought immediately like, okay, well now that's been lifted. I'm just going to be, but I just, I had to clear space. I had to, you know, I moved to LA and then I moved to a different part of LA a year later. You know, I wasn't at peace where I was and my, my space wasn't good. I had to just create the circumstances to write again. And I was very bitter about this. Hmm. It's, hard, it's hard to create space to write, period. Everything about capitalism, everything about the world is just, you know, there's tons of inspiration, but there's not always a lot of quiet, you know, and I don't literally mean, you know, silence. But no, like, but there's a difference between silence and quiet. Those are definitely yes. two different things. The sovereignty yeah. of quiet. Yeah. Yes, quiet. Yeah. yes. And just having that sort of space and, you know, like I can find quiet in a lot, you know, New York. I lived in New York for 13 years. Like I, I and I miss it terribly. Part of the reason that I was in Inglewood when I first got here, part of the reason that was a rough fit was because Inglewood is very suburban. Yeah. In my mind, you know, I grew up rap music, Inglewood yeah. up's no good. Dr. Dre. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm like, you know, I'm thinking of black community and I usually think of black communities as hustling, but, you know, noise and people and like, it's a quiet little suburb. And I'm just like, oh no, this is this is not sparking anything in me, you know? Like this is Flossmore. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So most people struggle with quiet and, and creating a space to write and you know, and getting through your own mental blocks or depression or work or any number of things. But when you add to like, you know, I'm a single parent. Since we've moved to California, we divide my daughter's time 50-50. So I'm a I'm extremely privileged as far as single parenthood goes. But like we're, you know, like 
half the time I'm with her, half the time I'm by myself. So those are like the two words, like the two conditions that people describe as like the most not enviable during COVID, like having children and that being are in school <laughs> and being alone. And like You're I have them both. both. <laughs> and so they're typically, so like usually as a single mom, like the fact that I have that solo time is seen as a blessing. And, I, and even under these circumstances, I see it that way, but it also is a different kind of way of having to function in the world. And so I'm lucky that I've gotten some of this stuff in order before then, because I probably wouldn't be writing now. And I'm, and I'm writing a whole lot more now than I was at the beginning. Like it, it, it's coming, it, you know, things are coming out of me. Like it, it's just, and I, it's, it's again, like it wasn't that I wasn't writing it all before. Like when Kobe passed, I sat down that day and wrote like 5,000 words, you know, about him, about the rape allegate, you know, it was just kind of like, because, and I, and I wanted to publish it. And I was like, I think I'm going to say this for a book project, but I like, there was this complicated conversation that like I saw kind of brewing around and I'm like, but I also saw people that wanted to have a conversation about rape culture that were not at all able to process the profound grief and sorrow of the people that they needed to have this conversation with and that you cannot get past it. You can't hop over it. Like you had to acknowledge and affirm that like, we're not ready for that conversation about him specifically yet. Right. And we will, we must get there. But because of the, the so the manner of death, the fact that we have committed to not engaging with the worst sides of people we love, period, as a practice, you know, and so it's like you're asking people to up in everything that they know and believe in this terribly low moment. In the acute moment of grief, not even the like, yes. like chronic grief that comes over time, but like in that first right. moment, that's just not going to be the, the pivot point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just not. And it's like, and it, it's a constant, you know, I, I know that those of you all who are organizers and, and activists, and I don't think of myself, I always say I'm a writer, you know, like people <laughs> call me an actor. Sometimes I'll allow for it, but I'm like, I'm a writer. But folks that are reckoning with these ideas, it's like, I want you to hear this message. It's, so is the goal for me to say it or is the goal for it to be heard? That's a really important distinction that I think gets really lost. And it's, Different from thinking about audience, right? Because so often when it comes to writers, that's what gets kind of forefronted is like, well, who are you writing this for? Who do you hope reads it? But it's that's not even necessarily who do you hope is hearing it or how do you want them to hear it? That's a very different kind of like consideration. And from dialogue too, right? Because the idea is whether that's through writing or through relationship, if they're hearing it, then they can respond also. And it becomes an entry point, not just like a declaration of a position or a like you're wrong, I'm right type of type of situation. Absolutely. So you said more and more is coming out. It feels like something's opening up now. Yeah, like I've just, I've been writing, you know, some things that I won't share yet because I have a project, a secret project that Ooh. I'm so excited about. I, I've been writing comedy. I'm working on, so I moved to LA because I want to write a television show. So I've been working on a pilot script. And so I've been writing jokes. I have not worked on the script in a few weeks. And I wanted to over the break. I was like, yeah, I'm going to work over the break. I'm like, this was a break. This is why you're always <laughs> exactly. tired and mad. You never actually call it a break. It's usually like you don't get that much done because you feel like I'm on vacation. I shouldn't have to, but you don't go offline or you don't like give yourself a break and so it's unfulfilling it's like either work through the shit you know or don't but like don't kind of halfway in halfway out so I'm preparing for this re kind of in a reintroduction to the world as a writer again like I've kind of got this weird like pretty substantive social media following and I've done like you know some pro I've done some visible projects like I was in surviving R. Kelly you know, because I was around during, you know, that particular moment, kind of the beginning of Black Lives Matter. And there's a good number of people who are like, I don't know, like, I know her, she does something, you know what I mean? Like, they might know that I'm a writer, you know, or they're like, oh, she's a cultural critic, you know, like talking head person. But like, it went from one day, I was like, I'm a writer who gets to do talking head stuff. And then I became a talking head who occasionally writes. And I'm hmm. like, that was never what it was supposed to be. Right. And so like, getting back to who I am as a writer. So I've got like, and I'm very fortunate that like, I've had assignments come to me because I said I was ready. Assignments started coming to me and they were not, you know, the typically for the most part, they weren't necessarily a thing I would have thought of like writing about, you know, one of them was about money. That's something I've never talked about, you know, but it was just kind of like, oh, 
Actually, I do have some shit to grapple with around money that I think would be of interest and of use to a lot of people. I hate talking about money. I have a lot of anxiety about it. And and, and that doesn't lead to good financial decisions or, or health. And, you know, the, the thing about capitalism, like we don't destroy it by avoiding dealing with it. <laughs> you know, I see folks like tearing down on some, you know, newly wealthy, quote unquote, and not by, by wealthy, it's usually like some newly upper middle class, you know, black success story or just a young, you know, just somebody who's visible and young and, you know, like attacking them for being, oh, well, capitalists, they're selling this, they're selling that. I'm like, bro, everybody has to, like, you don't get to opt out of capitalism. It's going to happen to you one way or another. You know what I mean? It's about what are you doing? Are you being greedy? Are you being wasteful? Are you redistributing, you know, when you have more than you need? Are you invested in redistribution? Which is something I think about a lot, which obviously I I do have this belief in my head that I'm going to have a lot of money someday, but I'm just kind of (laughs) like, I want to develop a plan where people who have a lot of, like, there's this, you know, like, what's a percentage that we could get folks that earn over a certain amount of money to redistribute, right? Mm -hmm. Like, most people are not going to give away everything, but what's the livable number like why how do we start talking about redistributing resources and you know what i mean so it's kind of like i don't know that's kind of a tangent but like anyway we're fans of a tangent here this is a tangent safe space yeah (laughs) tangent safe space you know but but that's just something that's been on my mind a bit and like i thought about that and then i kind of got this opportunity to write about money you know so it's just like that's i think that's coming to me because i told the world that i was ready for it and um in this moment um i i feel very much like i'm having a good warm up i have i feel like i'm having a very good warm up all right everybody so we're back we're going to let y'all in a little bit behind the the zoom curtain of the recorded of this phenomenal conversation we're having here with jamila um so in a very meta sense right we're talking about the life of writing and, and maneuvering and you were in the midst of like giving us a very extended look and like your very dynamic work life and career as a writer. And in the midst of our conversation, you had to have a conversation with it with a publisher. So we put a pause. And then when we planned to reschedule was during the time of the 2020 insurrection for folks who've listened to this. 2021. 2021. Look at me tweaking. The January 6, 2021 insurrection on the Capitol happened during our time where we were going to reschedule. So we have taken a few days, we have caught our breath, and we are reconvening in this conversation with Jamila. So glad to have you back. And I, I want to come back to that conversation and like the choice of like how manu- maneuvering publishing and editing works. But I want to take us back to where we were when we left off. I actually have a little bit of notes of what I heard you saying, fortunately. I love how happy you were about the fact you had notes too. Oh yeah, because I very rarely, I very rarely have notes. (laughs) I'm a mental note taker for sure. I am. So so, I have my little I'm so proud when I have a note written down. (laughs) And it'll be like one word. Like if I show my note to somebody. (laughs) Or you can't read it. It's just Look at my little list of notes. This is, (laughs) it's more doodle. Yes. Uh, But I'm very excited to have these notes to reground in what I was hearing and then get to something that's really important for me. So uh, one of the things you were talking about as a writer was, you know, defining your relationship to audience. And I think that also connected to the tension with like writing on social media platforms and how you as a kind of like pseudo journalist, writer, publisher found yourself in this really dynamic, world changing social media moment that then like shaped a few years of your life. And something else that you mentioned a few times, very honestly and vulnerably, was the connection between your writing work and mental health and depression. And I, you know, I think all of these things are overlapping. And then a theme that has been going through this writer's thread, as we have fortunately been talking to Black women and, and women of color, um, is the way in which like writing against patriarchy creates this battlefield that you have to traverse, not only as a woman, but as a writer and thinker and practitioner in space and in community. Um, So that's something we would definitely love to get back to. But where I'm at now, one of the things that you said that was really important that I just alluded to was your relationship to this movement that has emerged and re-emerged. And now we're going on our seventh year. It's 2021. Ferguson was 2014. Trayvon was 2012. Uh, And you talked about your kind of fluid relationship to movement as a writer, not really an organizer, not really a journalist, but a a, a Black woman has been holding it down. Um, And so this is where I want to start. I want to start, usually we gas people up here, but I actually want to go a little bit deeper than the gas. I want to go to to a place of gratitude and thank you because your work, your being present um, and, and your connection changed my life, changed, I think, a lot of folks in my community's life. And you were a part 
of the beginning of what became the Let Us Breathe Collective. So you talked about being on the ground when shit was like just popping off and institutional media was creating this real vacuum of accurate reporting of what was happening on the ground. And you were one of the first people to touch down in Ferguson, just in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 after the the murder of Mike Brown by Darren Wilson and the uprising of, of the St. Louis community and the Ferguson community. And so my sister and other folks in my, my community and artistic community were outraged, want to participate I, we didn't know shit about organizing in the formal capital O sense of the word, uh, but just with Black people that cared about liberation, saw what was happening and wanted to be connected. And so had to access my sister, who was a freshman when you were a senior at Whitney Young, I believe, uh, was able to reach out to you because you were doing work and you were amplifying what was happening um, and ask what is needed. And you were able to reply, everyone needs gas masks, water bottles, and first aid supplies. And from that, we launched the Let Us Breathe initiative, which was a crowdsourced fundraiser to bring down gas masks. We got way more than we expected. And from that, began making weekly trips to Ferguson and formed the Let Us Breathe Collective in many ways alongside Lost Voices um, down in Ferguson. Uh, And like, you know, seven years later, I'm doing this show with defunding the police. The Let Us Breathe Collective has a a 4,000 square foot facility. Um, And you were one of the five to seven people that, you know, made that first step of making it happen. Anytime I tell the story of Chicago movement or Let Us Breathe, I don't be trying to name drop. So sometimes I say your name, sometimes I don't. (laughs) But I say a a friend or a trusted journalist was there and was able to give us this report back that then mobilized us. Um, So thank you. I'm emotional right now. Thank you so much. You were a big part and you were a collective piece of change in my life. And, you know, the work that you've done has changed the world in some some very important ways. So I want to offer you that. And go back to this question of movement relationship and how you see your relationship to this liberatory movement as we are in, you know, the shit kept going up, right? <laughs> but we also have to take care of ourselves and like find our own place and position. So thank you. And how do you see yourself in relationship to movement now? Well, first, uh, you're welcome. You know, your sister has shared that with me uh, some time ago. And I think at the beginning, I might have been vaguely aware that this was the introduction, you know, for you on some level. You all just took a little bit of like intel for me and ran with this so quickly. I forget that you all were not organizers for years and that you all had not been doing this for a really long time. You know, I just... Um, and again, we've we've all read about the, the civil rights movement, the black power movement, even the abolitionist movement, just how many, you know, the, the first abolitionist movement and how young the people who have guided this work have been. Right. And yet in real time, you know, you're still there was still, I think, this kind of element of surprise and kind of awe that like, hey, these are 17, 18, you know, 22, 25 year olds that are uh, changing the world right before our eyes. And I think that, you know, I was very fortunate to be one of the people to help, you know, and there were people, I think, on all sides of media from, you know, I look at someone like Wesley Lowry, who was a Washington Post reporter, how fraught those relationships can be, right, with people who represent, you know, big journalism institutions and mainstream newspapers. You know, I, I think about him and Ryan Riley from the Huffington Post being arrested in that McDonald's. Wesley, arguably, you know, has encountered these things before being a, a Black kid from a, a Midwestern suburb. But like, you know, a whole lot of members of the media acted as if until that point, you know, what a police information officer offered to them was the law, right? This is the official accounting events. This is what happened. And whether that was right or wrong, we're still going to decide, you know, or we're going to put it to our audience to decide that based on this official accounting of events. There was a a relearning for a lot of media people that wasn't a relearning for me, you know, as a Black woman, as somebody who is from the Midwest and, and understands that, like, you know, people said, this isn't the South. You know, and I'm like, where the, the, everywhere is the South and the South is not shorthand for bad things happening to black people. Our experiences there are not unlike our experiences elsewhere. Arguably, we, we have more autonomy and freedom and community right, in, in many parts of the South than we do uh, in some of the other places where we are concentrated. You know, in terms of seeing my role, I, I think that was around the time where I really started to understand that Tony K. Bambara quote, you know, that the job of the writer is to make revolution irresistible, you know. And so I was always careful, you know, there have been times where people have referred to me as, as an activist or a leader in some way. And I, you know, 
I can run from a compliment. I'm very good at it. You know, I do my best <laughs> to dive like a lot of women do. Um, but I, I, I respectfully at times, sometimes I just kind of sit and kind of allow people to say that because I don't want to hurt their feelings. But I really do just feel honored that whether it was the work that I was able to do there, whether it was the writing that I've done about gender, you know, there's this group of writers that has come right behind me that may have in some way, you know, some of them... Uh, younger Black women writers in particular who were influenced by this group of Black women online or Black, you know, I, I'd i say primarily Black women, but, you know, there were also, uh, there have been non-Black women of color, there have been, you know, Black men, there have been, you know, Black queer and non-binary folks that have taken this microphone that the internet gives us and used it to do uh, meaningful paradigm shifting work. And Can we do so, some some, yeah. some naming right there? Are there folks in your cohort or that you see as like part of your peer group that you would like to name? And then are there folks that are like continuing or expanding that legacy that you are seeing coming up behind you that you're really excited about? Yeah. Like who's in your rookie class, you know? Sure, yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting because my rookie class, um, we've taken a lot of different directions. You know, I would say it includes people like Demetria Lucas, who primarily has written about relationships, but has come to write and, and do a podcast about um, the lives and experiences of Black women, uh, I think in a way that is in direct response to the conversation she's been having with her audience, you know, over the years, that it's not just a matter of, you know, I like this boy, does he like me? It's like, how do we navigate dating and patriarchy? It's like, if we're talking about, you know, the dynamic between people across gender lines. We have to talk about why they are the way they are. We talk about racial uh, division. We have to talk about why it exists, right? It's not a matter of preference or happenstance. This is white supremacy, right? This is capitalism, like context. You know, I, I, I love you, Ajayi is part of my rookie class, um, you know, and I see how she's used social media and, and her own writing in a really interesting way to push conversations forward. But in terms of the folks who... Why well, and I adore and admire those girls, but um, Michael Denzel Smith, Darnell Moore, Raquel Willis, um, Rembert Brown, and uh, Jason Parham, and, and just you know a lot of folks that were primarily culture writers, you know, who have used that kind of writing to tell stories that are um, essential and urgent. You know, Eve Ewing is a few years younger than me um, and, and grew up on a different side of town. So we didn't come across each other in Chicago. Uh, we, we met, you know, many years later. But I was just shocked for somebody who I admire. She's in that Kendrick Lamar box, you know, where it's like, wait, you're mm -hmm. younger than me. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. how, did, how did you become my favorite rapper? That's not supposed to happen. Yeah, exactly. You know, and like he was the first one. I was like, wait, they making people younger than me and they can rap. <laughs> You know, <laughs> like it starts one day you look up That's and perfect. the rappers and the ball players are younger than oh you. Oh, my God. So I just turned 29. It took until I was 27 until I accepted. All right, Daniel, you're not going to play in the major leagues. Like, it's just not going to happen. Like, the, it would have been a long shot for yeah. the last 27 years of my life. But at some point, it's like you, you've you officially you're aged out of that box. Yeah. Listen, the fact that Beyonce is three years older than me makes me kind of feel like I still have time. You know, and it's mm -hmm. not that I'm going to do any of the things that she's done. Done, but I'm like, hey, Beyonce's super cool, and she's older than me. There's still, and time. she's always going to be three she's, years older. Like that, that's gonna you're gonna be able to hold on to that. Yes, yeah. forever. So there's fabulousness left, right? Yes. Like it, 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 I, she's yes. always a barometer of how much fabulous we can be. Yes, there's <laughs> fabulousness left. Uh, but that you know, I was really surprised and honored that she, you know, told me directly once, you know, that you are part of the reason that, you know, the work that I do and, and you know, and, and that a whole lot of other Black public intellectual thinker people who you might not think that have come across you, uh, because there was a time where taught, and this is specifically, I think, for things that I've written about and talked about publicly around gender, because that was not the conversation that, you know, a lot of folks were having for a very long time. And those of us who were, you know, all of a sudden one day had a microphone. I was the annoying chick in the lunchroom at Whitney Young trying to get my friends to listen to me preaching about these things, you know, and now it's what everybody's talking about. And so in terms of folks that have come, and I know I'm forgetting, Michael Arsenault, uh, a really great group of, of writers and thinkers, Danny McLean, you know, some of whom are reporter, uh, um, 
Oh Lord, I'm blanking out her name. And, and, um, and we put you, we set you up to fail having to list. You all shout your out, yeah, a no. great amount as well. <laughs> and and we can put the caveat of if the name isn't named here, that doesn't mean that they don't count. You, you the pressure of having to name all the people. I'm going to take yeah. that off of yes, your shoulders. Yes, yes. Thank right. you. I apologize. That's, that's, a, that's a podcast nightmare right yeah. there. It, I smoke a lot of weed, so I will you I know, be honest about the fact that sometimes, <laughs> you know, things don't come to memory just the way that I'd like them to. Um, in terms of some of the writers who are a little bit younger than me, um, who I, I really admire, um, Ivy Ani and Brooklyn White, um, who writes about music and culture, and just the way that they, Sylvia Obel, they are using pop culture to have, you know, meaningful conversations about issues of race and gender and power, which is something that, you know, was really at the heart of the beginning of my career and kind of where I'm coming back to. You know, I I feel like it's a space where I can help folks better understand the circumstances under which you are living, under which you are struggling, under which you are surviving, right? Is that, you know, having a conversation about Megan Thee Stallion and Tory Lanez and, and what the public conversation about that incident says about the ways that Black women are not protected, right? What does it mean to say Black women feel unprotected? And, and what does it mean for men who have been persecuted and unjustly hunted down by police and prosecuted to be faced with women saying, you know, I don't feel safe, right? And so if I don't have a place to turn to in my community to feel safe and I don't feel safe turning to law enforcement, right? Like just the battle that we watched Megan go through of like, I didn't call the police. I was not going to cooperate, like essentially having her arm twisted, right? To to cooperate with law enforcement, feeling like she had no other options perhaps and, and that watching people debate whether it was okay or not for her to have been shot, right? And so it, it, it's, there's so much happening uh, around us even in a space like entertainment that is so much deeper and bigger than entertainment, you know, and I think that those of us who have, you know, the ability and the access to really talk to people about those things in a way that helps them better understand what does this mean for, you know, the issue that arose in my school when this guy and this girl, you know, had a challenge or when this woman was, you know, attacked and and people were saying certain things around us. Yeah. So to that, to that point, I mean, there's the, significance of being someone who's like sharing a perspective in that conversation and then there's also the very important role of facilitating and shaping like what are the like containers for that conversation to actually happen in a productive way and i think to that rookie class conversation there were a lot of times that i can imagine where you were being asked to comment on something that was being framed in a way that we would like find unacceptable now So I'm curious for you, how have you learned to push the framing of the conversation that you're being invited into and to make sure that you're not being forced to basically have the same conversation about gender-based violence uh, or gender dynamics and power uh, that actually challenges it rather than is just like... uh, rehashing the same conversations over and over again. Can can I ask some context to that same question? It's Mm -hmm. the exact same question. I just want to like... Add some sauce to it. Damon just thought he could do it better. That's <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, you, you said it more clearly than I would have. I'm going to come back to this this notion of like angry in the in the lunchroom. I think that's a really important metaphor. That's what, where I want to end it on. But one of the things that you're kind of naming humbly that I recognize is that you were a part of a cohort that really like established a voice that we kind of now know as like Black Twitter, uh, in a sense, or like a new discourse. Uh, around like intersectionality and and multiple layers of oppression in a popular sense, right? So I think the Megan and Tory conversation, which is something that like I think this space can very easily like smooth paths and be more intellectual about, uh, is really important because in this question of like what has changed and what where are we provoking now, not only was there this like popularization of an intersectional analysis that now a lot of people are, are equipped with. Um, there also was a popularization of an anti-feminist backlash that I think, you know, patriarchy has always existed. But I think as there was new naming, there now is a new level of like intellectual abuse, like gaslighting and like reaffirming the position um, as these new critiques have happened in the, the Twitter sphere or wherever you're writing. So I want to go back to Daniel's question and like, let's make ourselves the angry girl in the lunchroom again. And like, what at least we- annoying girl. Cause you didn't say, angry. <laughs> you didn't say angry. Ooh, I apologize. That's annoying funny. girl in the lunchroom again. I want to use the exact words. And like, what is the push that the proverbial lunchroom needs 
now that these dynamics have shifted. Sorry, kids. I hope that. No, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say, you know, I'm really I'm pretty fortunate that in terms of kind of getting pushed into having to have the same conversations over and over again, either having to deal with intellectually dishonest attacks or just, you know, the very one on one stuff like, do I still have to explain this to you? Do we still have to grapple with this? Um, I think I'm in a position where, you know, not having a the, the only publication that I, I contribute to on a regular basis, uh, I, I write parenting stuff for them, right? So there's nobody that's saying you have to step in and talk about this. You know, you may be tired of this discourse. You may feel like we've beaten it to the ground, but like, you know, you, you just have to do that. So I, I no longer have that pressure just by the virtue of me being able to be choosy about what I write about and, and making this decision to have been choosy, right? So there are things I've turned down that, you know, maybe paid a lot of money or, but we're not in alignment with what I want to do, what I feel like is the right thing for me to be doing, which is, the, you know, what's the right way for me to contribute to what's going on. Um, and also just kind of being like, I can't do this with y'all again. You know, like I, I'm, I'm not here right now. But I think that, yes, that gaslighting, that like, there's a podcaster I listen to. She has a show called um, A Little Bit of Juju. And she talks about uh, Black traditional spiritualities. And, and she describes it as a feminist progression, right? That's happened in recent years. This shift toward better, you know, gender politics that's happening across communities and, you know, that has shifted activist circles, right? Because you may have been doing environmental justice or racial justice, but you weren't doing it from a lens that, you know, engaged gender or sexual orientation or class, right? That we're thinking about things um, through this perspective of multiple locations for trauma, multiple locations for disenfranchisement, multiple locations for power, you know, and, and what do those things mean to us? So like with that, in the face of that progression, you know, there it, it's, if you're in your late twenties, like you all at your age, I would imagine social media has been a factor for you all your entire lives. So it's not that you all are, you know, most of your, you're certainly your whole adult life. So it's not that um, even if you weren't super into it, that you might have missed this entirely. But I think that for a lot of people, and, and certainly for folks that are a few years younger than you all, you inherited an internet, these platforms that are in many ways different than they were when I met them because of this peer group that I belong to, right? So like, I used to get dragged down by Black women in my peer group. You know, if we're talking about privilege, right? That was a big thing. I remember the Black Male Privilege uh, Checklist by Jewel, uh, I think Jewel Woods came out around 2010, 2011, or it had been, or maybe it had been out for a few years and it started circulating then. And like the conversations and the debates we were having then about that would be so different today, but there was just so much vitriol and so much hatred and so much resistance and, and overwhelming love and support from Black women, always, my entire life, whatever harm or, you know, not good vibes I've gotten from sisters have always been canceled, or I won't say canceled out, but, you know, balanced out by so much more in terms of positivity and affirmation. But like, it was not popular to be feminist is what I'm trying to say. Right. <laughs> and like, there was, there was perhaps a social toll. Um, yeah. There were people who, you know, could get with the stuff I was saying about race, right? So I had this kind of complicated kind of dual audience thing happening, right? Where there'd be a lot of oftentimes men who, you know, all in, where you're talking specifically in defense of a Black man, because even for a feminist woman, so much of how, you know, for so many years, how I was socialized to think about racism and oppression was to censor the needs of, of Black men and boys, you know? And, or to always just understanding that whatever's going on with them, I have to be part of the response, right? I'm going to have to name that, I have to call it out. And I still believe that that's my responsibility. That didn't change now that I recognize that there is a parallel need on behalf of Black women and girls and on behalf of uh, Black LGBTQ people, right? That there are all these needs that exist within our community and not just the one that we've known how to name and recognize. The backlash to that has been, and I think we touched on it a little bit last time, so significant and so severe that you know, it, it's part of the reason that I've been quiet for a couple of years. It's part of the reason that I needed to kind of recharge, reassess, kind of figure out who am I and what do I want? I never doubted my intentions. I never doubted. 
I have not often doubted my my talent or my value. I think everyone, strictly everyone who deals with depression and anxiety has moments of, you know, am I good enough? Am I, you know, am I faking it? There's imposter syndrome, of course. So, you know, I think of those as pretty kind of normal things that I wouldn't directly attribute to, you know, being harassed online, but. But it didn't help with them. <laughs> it did not help, you know, and it took on a level of ugliness that just, you know, lies being told about my family and just really awful, awful hatred being lobbed toward me and others, right? And so it's in the same way that I reflect on my successes and triumphs as part of this group. That pushback is something that I feel is part of a group. So it's not just what happens to me. It, it's seeing it happen to other Black women, right? It's seeing it happen to other, you know, marginalized voices. It's, it's seeing that every time a Black woman reaches any sort of visibility, she could be a cook, right? She could sell shea butter or chef, rather. It, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's doing political work, but the body is political, right? That that we, We're inherently political. And so watching it go from everybody's rooting for you to we can't wait for you to mess up. You know, and the second you mess up, you're irredeemable. Whatever value you had before is so drastically uh, compromised by you falling short in some way, being imprecise with your words. The rules shift for Black women in real time. Like all of that, I think cumulatively, it, it, it takes a toll. But I, I'm very fortunate to have been in a position to have that reset and to just kind of say, like, where am I needed? You know, there are times where something would happen. It's like, girl, you know, you know, a couple of years ago, you would have written an essay. Where are you on this? They need you. And then it was like, no, I don't necessarily know that I'm needed. Am I essential? Who am I to say that my voice is essential? Right. There's so many voices. And then kind of working through, like, it's not about saying, like, I, I, I'm the best on the most important. It, it's. I am capable of perhaps helping people to understand this. I've retreated into a place where I've figured out or I'm constantly kind of figuring out like what writing looks like for me now and and where am I needed and trying to live there as opposed to just being present to say that I'm working. Yeah. Yeah. And I I could imagine that some of the ability or what makes that easier comes from the fact that there is this cohort. There's just more people who can help answer those questions. So it doesn't, it can take some of the pressure off of having to be the the, the feeling of like, if I don't respond to it, that voice won't be heard or that perspective won't be heard. It's like, no, we can collectively do that. Not me, but we can collectively do that. Um, Dame, you mentioned the like the last kind of pinpoint of encounter between the two of y'all. And that was a great kind of jumping off point. I think there was one more and it actually ties in a lot to what we were just talking about. Uh, do you want to tell that story? Um, I'm trying to make sure we're talking about the same thing. A particular dinner party? Oh, I totally forgot about that. Speaking of, you know, the patriarchal battlefield, (laughs) do you remember that like post-Ferguson early BLM dinner we had at Farrakhan's house? I do. I do. (laughs) (laughs) Which is just a great sentence. Yeah, I I tell the story to Daniel all the time about how surreal, because I kind of like, I wasn't like at the top of the invite list at that time, you know. People got to do me, but like I got to just happen to be there because I was coming with folks. And so I felt very much like a fly on the wall. And I was like, you crashed a party. of. <laughs> <laughs> I felt very intentional about like in general, I just want to be like listening and learning. Um, and so, you know, he's doing his soliloquy, saying some like brilliant words, talking about some global shit. He like goes too far and like his Jewish like, <laughs> like what we could do without yeah yes, you know, but he, let's come back on track he goes too far um and and i don't remember the provocation i feel like it was just asserting gender roles but he said something very conservative and very patriarchal it's about bill cosby that, like, that's oh, no. what it was oh shit it was oh cosby. my god okay yeah. i'm gonna just let you i don't know why, why i feel so compelled this is like a so. mad lib at this point <laughs> this is incredible but, it, but just to like set the table right like you know, he, it's this big palace, mm-hmm. Elijah Muhammad's old house. It's a dinner table with like, you know, 40 people can sit at this table. There are not even like in a disparaging sense, there are like servants or like waiter. There's like a staff. I don't know what, how they call it uh, um, for folks who are like not familiar. Um, and so place there, not only are you there, Charlene Carruthers is there, Dream Hampton is there. Um, and there was just like a moment, I remember, where he said the Bill Cosby thing where like everybody just like stopped. And like looked at y'all 
And like, there was the moment of like, are we going to put up with this shit? And it wasn't combative, but there definitely was like, we are not going. And that was pretty much like the rest of the conversation. That's my memory of it. I'm sure you actually have a much more vivid memory of it. And can you please help me relive that moment? Yes, that's pretty much how I remember it going. You know, it was a complicated set of circumstances. You know, I think most people don't really understand the very complicated relationship that Black people, particularly Black folks on the left, have to, you know, the nation um, and to Mr. Farrakhan. And, you know, it was an invitation that you would not turn down under most circumstances, right? It, to be in this room with these people in this moment. The, the threat of Black conservatism um, that is so omnipresent and, you know, our, our Black elder leaders and organizers. And of course, there's a whole lot of other things that I do not agree with, um, with, with the minister. I, I, I should hope that goes without saying, you know, um, but it was still, in a, you know, it, it was an invitation that I was, you know, almost in the, the same way. I was kind of like, I'm just a writer, you know, like I'm kind of, you know, we're not, they didn't want me to cover it, but, you know, uh, just come be there. And I was like, all right, cool. And I grew up, uh, he lives on 47th in Greenwood. I grew up on 51st in Greenwood, right? Like I look like in a one bedroom apartment across the street from the Obama now, you know, where the Obamas live in their little mini mansion. And so I, I went past this house many times. I remember my sister fell off her skateboard in front of the minister's house when she was a teenager. And uh, the Fruit of Islam came and she thought they were coming to help her and they were rushing her out. The, you know, like, nah, you got to get out of here, sis. They thought she was trying to create a diversion or something. You know? <laughs> so it's just kind of like, so the idea that I'm going inside of this space is that I think oh. for most people, you know, most Black Southsiders in particular, is kind of like, whoa, you know. Mystical. It was mystical. very mystical. Very mystical. Um, and the conversation is going well. And I really, I think it was less about I think it was an important sort of affirmation for a lot of the young people in the room that regardless of how problematic or complicated uh, the minister's views are or, or the religion itself or religion in general. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you if you think they're if you think they're got some issues, wait to hear about everybody else yeah. too. Like it's <laughs> like we're all kind of go one of every religion, you know. Um, that. I think it was really something to see, you know, for me to see you all, right, to see that these are the organizers, these are the activists, like, and that they're getting this uh, at a time where civil rights groups were not being terribly accommodating and welcoming to uh, folks that are participating in the Ferguson uprising, that, you know, someone who represented uh, an institution like that was opening, at the very least, just opening his doors. Yeah, I forget that part of the context because this is maybe January of 2015. Mm-hmm. So we're like in like the first five to six months. And at that point, like both Jesse and Sharpton had had like moments of hostility. Absolutely. And so that I forget about that context. A part of it was really the love of like, hey, these old heads by me, they are super whack. Like we can have whatever disagreements. Yeah. But like I'm opening up my, my home and my table to you and I'm validating yes. what you are and what you're a part of. That, that I do want to make sure that, that we document. It was important. <laughs> Definitely. And then, you know, the Cosby comments and, and others, but those in particular kind of reminded us like, oh, this is why there's a call for new, you know, new thinking and new leadership. Here's here's where we are. And so I like, you know, I think the difference between being an, an old millennial versus, you know, a younger millennial like you all or a Gen Xer. Um, I at times like that deference. So when that comment happens, I, it was very, it got hot in there. I remember I had on a nice dress, you know, like I had on a dress and hit, cause I'm like, again, I'm, this is trippy. So like I, I came, you know, pre- looking nice. And so I'm sweating cause I have on a dress and probably some spanks. And like, I walked to the restroom and I was talking to, uh, you know, a couple of the brothers there, like, yeah. Um, we got to talk about, you know, and so, and there was a couple, a couple of the sisters had also gotten up, you know, like they were like, mm. oh, there was like a little quiet run. Like it wasn't addressed right away. There was like a little coughing and a few of us in the bathroom. And I believe it was uh, Rahel Testifamarium who was the one who, who raised her hand and said, okay, well, you know, I, I don't think we're going to be able to move on until we address this. And she did it in such a beautifully clear way. It, it, it was not, you know, apologetic. It was not, you know, skirting the issue, but it was in a respectful way. Um, and it was received with respect. It didn't become a debate, you know. True, um, true. 
And so, yeah, that was that was quite a month. Like, I got a highlight reel. I've been in a lot of places where I'm like, how yeah. did I get here? You know, like, who? Yeah. why am I here? Why do I, yeah. you know, like, I feel like I'm just kind of watching. And that was definitely one of those things that I don't think I said too much. I just kind of felt like it was, it was my place to watch. And I'll say if I could do anything over, I just know that having the privilege of being in so many of those rooms in that time period, you know, watching. I just only wish that I had, because I had the the recognition very early that the personality differences and geographical differences, the class differences um, uh, amongst the people who had showed up uh, in Ferguson and as well as, you know, the the native St. Louisians, um, I think that's how you say it, mm-hmm. you know, people who were from the area. I think that had there been some more efforts around, you know, a retreat of some sort, a kind of like, let's sit down together. And I know those things did happen, but I feel like in the space that I had access to people, you know, I've heard the the saying, you know, friend to all is a friend to none, but I really have, I try to be, you know, fam, right? I try to be fam, right? There's this book called Our Our Kind of People, and it's about America's Black upper middle class. Basically, you can't can't earn your way into this group, right? It doesn't matter what you've achieved. Like, they might respect you. They might hang around with you. But like, I'm not that kind of Black person, but I've always wanted to be every kind of Black person's Black person. (laughs) Like, I want everybody, I like everybody should, really everybody's part, you know? And like, and have wanted to be that without concession, you know? So it's like, so I'm not going to compromise my values. I'm not going to pander. But I'd like to think that at my core, what I want for us is good. And and it's in everyone's best interest. So you should like, fuck with me off of that. You know, like I'm a good, (laughs) I'm I'm one of the good guys. That resonates so hard. Like one, the like the appreciating that mobility and access to to be able to engage many different positions in the black community. And secondly, man, that 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 friend of everybody quote that that kind of like shoots at my heart. I think I think where we we what we're both saying though is like I may not fuck with everybody, but I do want everybody to fuck with me. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I don't want to be their friend, yeah, but I yeah, want to the, know. They should show me love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, should, you should like me. I might have a critique of you. You know, it depends on whether it's going to be a loud one or just want to keep to myself. But like, you, sh- you should fuck with me. So, so, so funny. we've been talking about some of this positionality. You talked about uh, being 47th in Greenwood. You talked about what type of black person you ain't. We talked about generational things. And I got I got a shout out that I, I really want to do. Um, shout out to Pops. Shout out to your dad. You know, me and your dad actually became like locker room buddies at LA Fitness. <gasps> I just <laughs> I did not know that. I just heard him talking. <laughs> and I don't know how I was able to recognize him. And we'll we'll be able to like tell some of the backstory of like some of his claims to fame and his legacy. But he was just talking just like some old head, kind of like radical national, but just like also just like grown man talk. And I'm like, are you Jamila's dad? And he's like, oh, oh wow. I'm so glad. Like, you know, that's a thing that he said, like in the last 10 years, he became Jamila's dad is like the way people see him. Uh, so shout out to my homie, man. I don't know if he would recognize me, but the Aww. kid with the braids and the twist, <laughs> and we, we hung out a couple of times in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I respect him because he keeps protocol. He's like right in that generation. I feel like the, the generation above him may be a little too naked in the locker room. Yes. He's very, very well covered. <laughs> He respected the space, uh, but but he would also, we would chop it up and he would give me some game. But but shout out to your dad, uh, who among many other things is one of the highlights of one of the best movies in the history of American culture. Uh, <laughs> it was Spook Who Sat By The Door. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just shouting about, how, how's your dad doing? My dad's doing well. Thank you for asking. You know, he's a, he's a cool dude. You know, he he, he, he's, he's a very cool dude. Like he's an interesting character. He's, he's from high, he's a biracial. He might even be a, a cat. He might yeah, even be a cool cat. My dad's definitely a cool cat. <laughs> you know, he's definitely a cool cat. Like he, he was raised in Hyde Park. Um, he was, if you've ever seen the spook who sat by the door, um, which is a story about a man who, uh, uses the training that he gets as a kind of token uh, Black CIA hire who is given a a position with no power whatsoever, but is still trained as a CIA operative, who then takes that training to uh, take a group of Black street gang members and turn them into a highly organized um, militia, you know, a liberation army that takes on the government in Chicago. And it is based on the book by Sam Greenlee. And there's a character named Pretty Willie, who's this very like complexion dude who's got a you know cute little 
little crib that his, you know, parents pay for because he, he, you know, because he's in college, which was not my dad's story. His parents, you know, his mother was not paying for anything and, and he didn't go to college. But uh, aside from that, he deeply, you know, related to his character being um, a biracial Black man and, and somebody who was a member of the Black Panther Party, who was, you know, and has always been prepared to fight on behalf of our people, you know, just kind of how people looked at him and, and what it meant to be a, a high yellow dude who could have used that to translate into a whole lot of other stuff. Like my dad talks about um, a woman in his neighborhood who tried to pay him to take her daughter to a cotillion, right. To a debutante ball. And he was like, I wasn't well-mannered. I wasn't, ha-, you know, like I was just light skinned. Like there really was not much else to me that, you know, not that I wasn't a nice kid, but there was nothing, you know, well-mannered in the sense of like, this was not somebody who was, you know, in spaces like that, who would yeah. not trained to chaperone. No, he's not necessarily. He, he's yeah. not a bow. No, he's not a bow, <laughs> right? He was not a bow. Um, you know, a good dancer, but not a bow. And so he, um, and, and so he read the book. He related to the character. Had the opportunity to meet Mr. Greenlee. Um, like he was a but. My dad was a busboy at a restaurant, I think, in Hyde Park that later became that bar, Louis. I think that's where it happened. Um, and. You know, he said, if you ever make a movie of this story, like I, I am pretty willing, like this is me, you know, and some years later it happened. And Mr. Greenlee Whoa. you know, was Whoa. able to find him, you know, like it was a couple years later. And he basically that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he wasn't a hard person to find. Right. Like, you know, so, <laughs> he's so, a cool cat. We've cool established cat. that. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's also he had a unique look and it was kind of like, you know, the the yellow brother who works at such as oh, brother Davy, you know, and so like. My dad has a really interesting story. I'm kind of torn because they're probably like, I want to talk a little bit more. And, you know, and then I'm like, I don't want to open up all that stuff. I just say my dad's had a really interesting story in life. Um, And one of the unfortunate things that has happened as a result of the ways in which I've made my own life public is that my dad has been subject to some... Uh, I'm told, okay, I'm going to say this, but like, if I text y'all before you edit this and be like, don't use it, then thank you. But, um, you know, some online conspiracy theories, you know, from a particular source who I won't name, because I feel like he's like Beetlejuice. You say, it, you know, three times he pops up, but like, just saying really awful things about him to harm me. You know, and so it's just the irony uh, and, and really this person having no and, and their school of thought having no beef with me or no reason to take issue with me other than the fact that I'm a black feminist and not just anti-feminist. Are you, I'd say anti-woman. I mean, I think to be fan- anti-feminist is to really be anti-woman, you know, and, and anti-queer, but like who who feels that the the movement that arose from St. Louis that 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 you know that arose from death of Trayvon Martin represents a shift against black cis het men, right? Like it's okay if we're talking about maybe a black woman being killed by the state, but like the demand that we talk about it in a special way or that we center black women in that conversation being a problem. That talking about you know a Bill Cosby and R. Kelly who are these beloved black male figures who also do not like the the. Even with the things that Bill Cosby did for black colleges that were great. And even for he the don't things, fuck with you, niggas. He don't fuck. It never <laughs> has. Like, and, and the veil was lifted. Like, I'm old enough to remember the Cosby show being on the air. I don't remember him being a black, cons- you know, being conservative or anything. I don't remember his political attitudes because I was six. Yeah, you know, I was really I was, I was the show right. came on before I was born, but it stayed on. until I was about six or seven. Right. So I, I just know him as cuddly America's dad. But like. My freshman year in college, this man came and and I'm in tears. So I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm listening to Bill Cosby speak. And he's introduced by Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad. These are the people, these are the reasons I'm at a black college, right? Like without a different world, you know, like I'm first generation college grad. Like they introduced me to some stuff that meant a lot to my life. And so it's this beautiful moment. And he gets up there. In hindsight, I'm like, oh, you do not fuck with us, right? But at the <laughs> time, I just thought he was a a, you know, a a bitter. And and the most polite sense of the word elder who had, um, you know, who was disappointed in the lack of progress, who felt like, you know, when it comes to like hip hop, we're wallowing in our pathologies as opposed to taking them on. And that that's a very likely attitude that somebody that old would have. And so maybe we can work around it. Right. Like I wrote him a letter, asked if I could go on tour with him because I felt like he needed somebody to help him out. Mm, I literally was like, because I felt like I could talk to him. You know, I literally (laughs) did. I felt like he needs I I wanted to defend my generation and, and working class black people to him. But I also felt like his heart was in the 
right place, you know, at first. This is before he really, and then he kept going. But even with that, right? So like, if we just isolate him in that moment, this is not, you know, man of the people, right? If we just make him the pound cake speech guy, he he doesn't love us in that way. If we look at R. Kelly just simply on his body of work and, and his philanthropy, he does not fuck with us, right? There's no <laughs> R. Kelly community. Philanthropy. Because I'm like, where is it? You you know what I'm saying? Like, there's no, because oh, I'm like, so again, funny. at least yeah. Bill Cosby gave some money to some school. Yeah. I'm like, why is there such an impassioned defense of these people, right? Okay, Bill Cosby made some good shows, gave some money to some schools. R. Kelly made some music. Oh, that's, that's so, he didn't even do the like, Carbon offset of like yeah. donations on some like Cosby or wine shit. Nothing. It's like there's no, there's nothing, nothing, yeah, the- no, no guilt. He couldn't because he was spending all of his money paying out his victims. I would argue, you know what I mean? Like, can you start a community center if you're paying tuition for people who, to go to college because you were sleeping with them when they were 14 or you're giving somebody a lump sum every month to, to not, you know, because she signed an NDA or, or you're paying for all these people to work for you to protect you know, your interest in flying underage girls around the country. So with that, I'm like, these are the these are the guys that you want to die on? Like, with all of the other Black men who, and not just the murdered, you know, Trayvon Martins and the Mike Browns, but just like all the Black men and boys who I've loved and supported in my personal and professional life. And so for the, in fact, and, and the number of times that there was another Black man who might have been accused of something and that I yeah. just was like, I'm not going to jump in on this because... I, I am not interested in becoming the person who is only here to do that, right? And so maybe this conversation needs to happen, but I'm not the one to jump into it because you, you're not going to be able to uh, separate me from the idea of, you know, there being an attack on Black men. And like, also, one of the many things that's really hurt me about that is like, to defend these particularly loathsome people is to suggest that this is what Black men are, which I find more right. offensive than anything else, mm. right? Like, I don't... Right. I if you're going to pedestalize anybody and like, this is who we need to ride for, it's like, there's a lot of people who have been unjustly accused and need some people to ride for them. Need some riders like, really bad. Like, the, the Innocence Project exists. Like, there's a, an actual need. Right. Such a good point. There's, I'm not even heard that said directly enough yes. it's like you're right there is injustice <laughs> and unfair targeting yeah. you Don't just pick the wrong person to support right. yeah like why is it why is it not josh williams you know who was right. 18 right. when he was involved in an uh, you know in, in what was categorized as an arson during a protest in st louis and and has been incarcerated since 2015 yeah, you know shit. man so even even if you want to uphold the patriarchy like just pick a different pick dude. Pick a different guy. <laughs> pick a different guy. And so that that it was those guys was so painful that that would lead to this person in particular and the people he riled up turning on somebody who has loved black people, who has you know a, a history of activism and service. And um, so yes, it bothers me that like in defense of these black men who do not love us right, who have done harm to women, to Black women and girls and to other women um, in the service of protecting, you know, serial rapists, that somebody who has uh, been a member of of our community with love and intention would be attacked, Um, you know, and again, that I'm not my dad, right? And so it's like, right. I'm my own ass person. And I will also acknowledge that my father was a Chicago police detective, you know? Um, he was a very young person when he was a member of the Black Panther Party. He was one of the younger uh, members, which is why he has a child my age. And some years later, he was driving home from work. He was a journeyman carpenter and heard a, a commercial from the president of what it, this institution no longer exists, the African-American Patrolman's League. That's Renault Robinson. Is that who that mm-hmm. was? Oh, he founded it, yeah. Yep, and and this was a group of Black police officers who, you know, operated from the premise of so long as there are going to be police in our communities, we have to be represented among this uh group of people like we cannot allow people who come outside the community to be the only ones to to carry a gun and a badge and, and have this power and i think that if we're being completely honest the conversations that folks are having about abolition there have been people who've been talking about that since you know they could speak and there are people who were not having that conversation in the 80s right reform and you know good cops 
and better rules and better law. Like that was the the brunt of the black community's uh, engagement with how to fix this problem of policing. Um, and so I say that not to excuse or defend the fact that my father was a detective and he was a homicide detective. You know, it was not somebody who made a point, you know, you know, I see the way people in the community receive my dad. I mean, as a kid, it was annoying. Like, you know, everywhere we go, brother Davi, brother Davi, you know, and sometimes they'd be like, who is that? Oh, that's, you know, somebody who he knew from them being arrested. Right. And then they wanted to show him that they were doing well, you know, or somebody he knew from around the, the community from his work. And so policing is inherently bad. Right. It is not something that can be reformed. That is something that I know and recognize now. I'm okay with people not knowing and recognizing that and, and being well-intentioned 30 years ago. There's a level of intellectual dishonesty that just shows up, you know, when we're trying to silence somebody. So this was never about, you know, him or anything that, you know, he could have done. It, it was always about how do we shut this Black woman up? That was very painful for me. And, and, and it caused pain and harm to, to someone I loved. You know, my dad called me one day like, what the hell is going on? on the, you know, what is this? Who are they? What, what are they saying? Where is this coming from? And just like completely ridiculous, like absolutely absurd conspiracy theory, you know, grounded in nothing. And coming from people who do not know the history of the African-American Patrolman's League. Right. And so the commercial they heard on the radio was the president of African-American Patrolman's League saying, brothers and sisters, today is the last day for the, you know, to sign up to take the test again to the police academy. You know, we need our people in the streets. We have to protect our community. Um, and that he immediately drove over to, I think it was maybe um, somewhere on King Drive where they were handing out the applications, ran into a, a sister he knew from the Black Panther Party. And they kind of both did the like, you know, the Spider-Man meme. What are you doing here? What are you, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And they had, you know, essentially responded to the same thing. And I grew up, you know, spending a good amount of time around him and other black officers who trained me to fear and loathe the police, right? Who trained me to think of them as pigs, who trained to me to, to really recognize and understand them as an enemy force in our community. Uh, my dad walked to work because he wanted people to see that he was part of the community, you know, that he was not there to do harm, that he was not there to abuse, that he was, you know, one of them, um, that he wanted to help keep them safe. Now, I can think of a lot of better ways to keep Black people safe, but I also have the privilege of having this conversation in 2020 about policing and prison and what we understand now. So I don't feel shame or, or you know, that, that that's something that should be used in, in terms of engaging or interrogating me personally. You know, I, I, I won't defend him. I won't defend policing. I will say I understand and I respect the context in which he made that decision. And I don't think it's a decision that he would make if it were posed to him today. You know, and I've had that conversation with people over, you know, many people over the years, right? And there was a time where I was very defended, you know, like, well, you know, it's not, some cops are good or some, yeah, like some people are well-intentioned, Right. Like I can be a well-intentioned person and we're throwing a phone party, you know, on a hot day. My intentions were good, but the phone is, is just it can't survive this. Right. Like I, I just I can't make this <laughs> amazing metaphor <laughs> for you. policing. Yes. So funny. <laughs> like, you know, I, I just can't make this worth it. I mean, my favorite metaphor for policing is the, you know, the poisoned apple or the poisoned bag of candy. Right. Like if there's. 30 in the bag and only one of them is poison. They all look alike. Um, but except for the bag is poison too, right? So, right. Well, gonna say, yeah. so it, it's yeah. just that it, it, it's the bag is wrong, you know, and maybe you were sweet when you went in, but there, there's a limit to which you can be effective for your community. There's a limit to which I would rather come across an officer like my father during a traffic stop than I would, you know, a whole lot of other officers, but I would prefer not to come across police officers at all. Yeah, man, yeah. I, I love that there's, there's so much here. First, again, just like offering love again to your father and how unfortunate that that like moment of harassment happened in this way. But what we're talking about is actually really rich because one, I think also grounding historical context is really important. So one, that Black Patrolman's League that I know actually did try to do some like really nuanced progressive work and mm -hmm. was silenced and pushed out. And fought against the emergent police union and yep. CPD and had to pay the consequences. Yes, yeah. it's very similar. We actually, um, do you know Aislinn Pulley from BLM Chicago? 
I know the name. We don't know each other personally. Okay. Uh, but, I, but I bring her up because because similarly in kind of the same post mid 20th century uh, of like black men in Vietnam, right, which is also a contradiction. But many of those soldiers did like progressive and radical, like counter militaristic organizing within the space. And these are histories that really get erased. Uh, and then also to the historical context of time of you saying like, you know, 30 years ago, this actually is a much more valid question that we now have answers to. Yes. Because at that time, one police departments were first much more visibly segregated, right? Like it was actually an all white police force. So very similar to like Obama running for president at the time was a progressive move, even though he was like counter movement in so many ways. But now it, we can say literally, we know that a black president in office is not inherently a progressive thing. And it took experiencing that, right? So similarly, like knowing that like well to, to do communally grounded black people in police force actually won't counter the harm. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I think about my own experience this past summer when, when she got wild of, you know, experiencing abuse out of action and it was 90% black cops and it was 90% black men in the little locker room when they were talking, you know, harassing me. And the, 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 the nuance was they just beat our ass. They just were what much more aggressive in fighting us as black officers than, officers were in DC this past week, which is something I've been processing. But in talking to them, they were saying all these dumb conservative things, but they also were very sincere about they thought they were doing the right thing or they saw themselves in a certain way, uh, which I know a lot of people want to make more space for while we're still saying abolish the whole thing. And like, they, you know, a black slave catcher don't make slavery no better. But yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And then back to the, to the notion of this even this conversation we're having came from a disingenuous patriarchal attack. Cause one of the things that, that we just said that I've never thought about, like niggas will be more likely to tweet free R Kelly than free Mumia, uh, which like really like I could laugh at, but it's actually like heartbreaking. Like even those same exact characters, like we could be making movement for Josh and Mumia or all political prisoners or false. Yeah. Th- that was really deep. And I think to the point of, and I'll stop just trying to, re, you know, just gather what you said, <laughs> of, um, I think R. Kelly, even more than Bill Cosby, is really eye-opening to the the corrosion and the toxicity that Black fem- feminism has, like, pushed us to address and put us in a better place. Because for my take as a Chicagoan, as somebody who's, like, met R. Kelly, who knows entertainers, it feels like, in my understanding, as being kind of younger, he got heralded more after the abuse was named. I don't feel like in the 90s, he was this like, he's not Stevie Wonder, like musically, right? (laughs) Like he made some tunes and some melodies and I'm saying he's not like a platinum songwriter, but then he got heralded or revered in this like untouchable space. And I don't think he had until it was, oh, we have to protect black men at the expense of black women. That this documented harm um, that for me, I mean, at, for folks who've listened to the show at the long time, like R. Kelly <laughs> was a symbol. We used to play a game called Beef with the R&B Singer before like Dream and like, you know, things really like picked up to kind of amplify the fact that he was just out in the world um, and like to to use humor to like name patriarchy in, in the art. Um, but yeah, I never even thought about the fact that there is more support for actual abusers than there is for actually wrongfully punished people. Um, and what that says about the backlash or the counteraction of patriarchy that to come back to you, you and your family and your peers are taking the brunt of these like psychological intellectual attacks. Yeah. That was all that I heard. And that's really, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> it's, yeah. If you think like, look at the, the insurrection last week, right? So a Capitol police officer was beat to death. Right. By people with Blue Lives Matter. Flags. By people with Blue Lives Matter flags. Right. There's footage of a guy like ripping up. Basically, you know, they from some of the accounts, these people, when they encountered the cops, they were like, we're here fighting for you. Like they expected them to join along. And when they, they called them traitors, they called them traitors. Right. And so it's the fact that this officer is dead at the hands of the people who told us that they have to defend policing no matter what, right? If it's George Floyd, if it's Mike Brown, you know, there's always a reason to let them do their job. That in this moment, as they attempted to do their job, not only were they pushed aside, not only were they not, you know, respected for that authority, that that blue line is supposed to be important, that one of them was killed, you know, and and that they, and, and deliberately, right? This was not an accident, right? They, they killed, they murdered this person. And, it, it was never about policing, 
right? It was always about white supremacy. It was not about an anti-blackness. It was not about their feeling of safety. And if they did say it was about feeling safe, what they meant was feeling safe from us, feeling safe from Mexicans, feeling safe from people who represent a diverse America. It was the same thing when you look at, yeah, like, why isn't it free, Mumia? Why are these people who have devoted a lot of time and energy into defending the likes of an R. Kelly or a Bill Cosby or a Tory Lanez, right? Like, why them? What have they done to earn, you know, they're not innocent and they're not, you know, they're not active. And even if you do put Bill Cosby in that kind of complicated space of you did a lot of work and also Bill Cosby has confessed. So there's that, right? It's like, I think that did quiet down a bit of the defensiveness, but there's always <laughs> But not not entirely, not entirely, not entirely <laughs> right? And there's always a there, there's always uh, an opportunity for for folks to you know bring him up as some sort of symbol of something that should not have happened either because he was too old, too good, you know, the accusers were too dicey, whatever it is. I don't take it personally, even though it has hurt on a personal level. Nothing about this is about me. I mean, white supremacy is not about me, right? So I I don't take it personally if I feel like I've been discriminated against or or treated poorly because of my race. And so I don't take it personally when I'm having that experience um, as it relates to how I've talked about gender, you know, in public. But there is a sense of resentment and pain, you know, that just come like, whereas I don't, you know... Certainly white supremacy has caused me pain and and invites painful experiences to my life, even if it's just the times I've gone to the doctor and have, you know, in clear, concise language explained, you know, what's going on with me and have not gotten the appropriate amount of attention or interest from, you know, the doctor or the nurse, right? We've been made to feel like whatever I'm dealing with is insignificant or it's just in my head. And and we know that to be a common experience amongst Black people. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about the uh, health gap as it relates to Black folks because of the experiences of Black women and maternal health. You know, um, I dabbled in doula work for a little bit. I'm going to get back to it. Uh, Before that- Oh, you were a a doula dabbler. (laughs) A doula dabbler, yes. Um, But uh, you know what I mean? For that reason, because we have to keep black women alive. That hurts. We shouldn't have to do that. But when it comes to the intracommunal, when when it's the gender stuff and when there's brothers involved or, you know, other sisters involved, I have these expectations for people with whom I share community, right? And so that's Black people first and foremost. But even if it were a community that I created, right? If we're all saying that we're writers and we're in this space together, and now you're challenging the validity of me being a writer, right? If we're saying that we're all, you know, left at whatever it is, like when people who've taken the vow, you know, who say I'm a part of this, are not willing to recognize the fullness of your humanity because you're different than them, but we're connected by this thing. I, I think that there's a there's a certain kind of, of sadness. I don't take it personally, but it hurts me that somebody would want to hurt me because I've stood up for Black women. Um, that, that makes me sad. So I'm, I want to be really sensitive because you're saying some very poignant things to me and like re-articulating them. Is helping me understand them, uh, or helping me like feel connected. But I don't want to be like just saying your same thing. Um, no, I like but, being heard. Yeah, yeah. It's actually okay. like a big thing cool, for me. Cool. So cool, like, cool, when cool. somebody <laughs> restates what I said, yeah. I feel very good. It's, it's something really heartbreaking that is not new, but feels much more pronounced in the, in the connection you made. But I'm gonna end it in an optimistic place. I think bringing up the the, insur- the insurrection and the Trump phenomenon in relation to what we're talking about, I think is really important. And again, I don't think this is new, but one thing that I've said and recognized in my like little, you know, basic social movement theory um, is that oppression and oppressive systems always react, always slap down whenever there is a movement. It's like a law of nature that there's going to be a counter movement, right? And that's the thing that I feel people miss about the MAGA phenomenon is that they see it as this independent disgruntled white working class, just like responding abstractly to economic conditions. But those economic conditions were there the whole time. It was this reassertion of dominance because Black people started naming the harm, right? And that was taken as an offense and a sacrifice they were not willing to make, right? Like historically, throughout the however many centuries, like, right, white folks in this land 
make it almost illegal <laughs> to be held accountable for violence against Black bodies. And even, sorry to cut you off, I just no, want to assert that, you know, MAGA, it, it begins with reconstruction. That At any time that there's been an effort to right the wrongs of this country, um, you know, and, and to, in any small way, even uh, recognize what chattel slavery and Jim Crow have done, um, there has been pushback, right? And so that the fact that this moderate, you know, liberal, the only black man who could have been elected the first president, right? <laughs> right. Like Literally. it was not going to be Malcolm X. And I think that history will, you know, reflect the complication of the Obama presidency and pop culture figure and black man, right? That is deeply complicated. But that was the one that it was, it was not going to happen in any other way. And the first black woman in that office was not going to be anyone other than someone who is herself deeply complicated, like Kamala Harris, but just simply that level of participation, you know what I mean? And the American experiment was a threat to yeah. people, right? So yeah. that assertion of dominance is, is also in response to not just us naming the harm and saying, you know, we're taking it to the streets again, or we're, you know, we're calling things out, we're going to be visible on TV. It's like, you let a Black man have the top job. Right, right. And then when he had a top job, these nappy headed niggas started burning shit down, right? Like, yep. th- then they started complaining on top of having the, the, the White House. Then they started complaining. And I think people forget the timeline of even his bid for the Republican nomination is in a post Ferguson Black Lives Matter context, right? Mm-hmm. So this, this transition from this, you know, still large in number, but this like Tea Party context, which if we're being honest, it was like important in terms of Congress, but really was ragtag on like a popular level. And was funded by like- Coke Brothers, actual, right? Yeah, like yeah. it was just an astroturf response yeah, thing. Yeah. Not that there weren't people participating in earnest, but- But that's that's where the seeds, it was mm-hmm. an Obama backlash, but it was really after the, the uprising that then they started packing out stadiums and started like beating up people in the audience and having these red ha- hats and having these like death center chants. And so, right, it's not an independent movement. It is a counter movement. And it often doesn't get named as that enough until what we saw on the Capitol of like, oh, this is not pro-police. This is not pro-constitution. This is pro-dominance of marginalized and oppressed people. And also one one thing, sorry, one more thing I just want to point out that I haven't thought about in this context before until we've had this conversation, that the two people who were most uh, viciously, until the squad is introduced, that the two people who were most viciously attacked were a Black man and a white woman, right? Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, who for all of the ways that they do not represent <laughs> radical left politics in any way, shape, or form, you yeah. know, and it would have been nice if they had. It would have been if nice. They're gonna take all that beef. Yeah. You, know? take, yeah. you yeah. might as you might as well. I mean, looking back on it, you know, that's what yeah. I thought the book was gonna say. Um, <laughs> like I, I thought it was gonna be, well, if you were gonna do this, I should have just, you know, took my shirt off and just squared up. But like <laughs> I uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, but that I think it's interesting what it means to be a black woman, right? To have watched this. That's why I like, that was my chief reason for like when Kamala Harris announced her presidency, I was like, I'm not doing this with y'all, you know? Cause I'm like, I know how much you hate me. Yeah. <laughs> look how much you hate the if you hate white women it's kind of like you know they were these fake perfume i think they probably still some at walgreens like if you love ck1 you'll love tk2 right and so it's kind of like if i know you hate black men and i know you hate white women <laughs> just you wait <laughs> i'm not really thinking that y'all are gonna embrace this and i'm not really you know into you know regardless of how my feelings about her and and, and some of her past work may be deeply complicated right like i say complicated i, I i'm not I'm saying antagonist, I'm being clear to say complicated because I know how much everybody hates black women. It wasn't just about what's the right going to do. Are they going to burn the country down if a black woman is elected president? Are they just going to start shooting black women in the street? It's the left is going to do the same that they're going to immediately in ways that they you know, yes, we've got practice. We've got language we didn't have when Obama was running. That was a progressive moment in ways that it is not to us now. But how precise and good we get at critique, right? Like how 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 we can shred a, a black woman in ways that we can be a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more um, forgiving of other people. This is the second time America has surprised me. Uh, the first time was two thousand eight. There came a point where I was like, "Oh, this is going to be a Biden Harris ticket," you know. But I, I did not like. I think again, it was the same. Like literally, it had to be a pandemic. 
right? It had to be a racial <laughs> uprising. It had yeah. to be the black women are the only, you know, ones breathing life into the shell of the Democratic Party, right? That it had mm-hmm. to be all those things. And it had to be black and brown women who were further left of that candidate, you know what I mean? Who create the circumstances under which all like just all of these things conspire for this very kind of surprising complicated moment and then motherfuckers storm the capital right. <laughs> it's so like, right. yeah, all right and that is unsurprising right. and, that <laughs> is unsurprising. and so, so that brings me back to like th- this point of, 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 of counter movement right so establishing maga not as just like disagree white folks being racist or fascist in a vacuum it is if we want to simplify anti-blm and then they had this language right maga to to kind of like encapsulate that and so now this parallel of, you know, this BLM, if we want to call it that movement, was an intersectional insurgency and uprising, and also throwing rocks at patriarchy and particularly racial patriarchy. It might get named a little bit. I don't be on Twitter as much, so I don't think this is new. But what feels really pronounced right now is that that counter-feminist movement is parallel to the MAGA movement in the sense that, one, it just structurally is about reasserting this dominance not necessarily connected to any evidence or rationality. It's just about power position and violence. And it is literally fascist leaning in the domination of women and femmes. But even more specifically, it's not just parallel to MAGA. And this is marginal. It gets a little overblown. But we see that it actually intersects with with the Trump phenomenon as like, I do think it's overblown, but it is true that there was an increased vote of Black men for Donald Trump. And I think that is the overlap. It is, it is this rejection uh, that they share of this Black feminist politic. It just doesn't have a slogan, I don't think. I don't know if there's a hashtag. Uh, I guess Hotep is kind of what we have like called it, but I don't think that's accurate either. But it doesn't have a Make America Great Again structure, but it is very parallel. And I'll I try and, to protect and, and you whether, from saying that. <laughs> and whether it's like actively, like we are showing up to the to the rally, the information and the logics of MAGA being in circulation feed that and enable it, right? The normalization of those arguments like help feed this counter movement in a way that ultimately benefits nobody except for white people. And here's my optimist. Uh, I just want to end with the optimism and then I'm done. Y'all, we, we can start to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so doing this parallel of nigga ain't shit Twitter and MAGA Twitter, right? Um, I did feel a moment of rejoicing when I saw the insurrection. I did feel relieved in a sense of this is the ultimate revelation of what we've been saying, right? Like, not only did we talk about the fact that they killed cops, but there's also so much evidence of the ways in which the police state was participant, enabled, and and protected this. Yeah, right? I mean, cops flashing badges as their, yeah. like, reason why they Opening should Opening gates, taking selfies, right? So, so for me, that was so affirming because it's like, that's what we've been saying since Asada was chained to her hospital bed in New Jersey, is that the police is a is a fascist infrastructure, even if everybody in it is not actively doing Nazi salutes. But there are people there actively doing Nazi salutes. Um, and so seeing that, and then seeing the, the obvious contradictions of this popular fascist movement, I want to parallel that to like, I think I'm even, my life is an example, the same way in which your bravery and your cohorts, you know, bravery of popularizing Black feminism it did the same thing of it. It made these revelations, even if it's not loud enough. There are a lot of people who are seeing how ridiculous some of these things sound, how harmful they've been, how normalized they were. Um, and we might not have, you know, a storm the capital moment about black patriarchy. I think there is an accumulated compounded effort of many people that understand now why feminism is a more liberatory pathway than would have been possible 10 years ago if it wasn't for this like contradiction and this class intention happening out loud. Um, And so what's sad about it is like the harm that you have to experience, the fact that you have to like hide. I don't want to place that on you, but I feel like that's part of what you said of like having to like- Or retreat at least. Yeah, Yeah. that's better. To having to retreat or your father be attacked. Like I I don't want to smooth past that or like say it's all okay. But I am optimistic that, you know, the next decade is much more prepared to handle these contradictions because they've been revealed. Do you share in our optimism? I do. I do. You know, I mean, I feel 
like I've watched, you know, on and offline attitudes and hearts and minds change as it relates to gender. I've, I've watched people grow up, you know, I've grown up. I, I start, you know, social media for me begins as a teenager. But even if we just go back, I joined Twitter the day after Obama was elected. Right. And so... 2000. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're like, we got to talk. You know, and so I have I've had the opportunity of watching a lot of people, you know, people I may have gone to school with and knew casually people who have just kind of followed online just because I was just been following them. Don't know when it started. Just am mm-hmm. like I've watched, you know, cis head men in particular have this evolution around gender and and sexual orientation and identity, you know, and and to watch black cis head men step up and be defenders of black women and black queer folks, to watch white folks step up and be defenders of black folks in a in a meaningful way, right, is encouraging. And, and this summer's uprisings was very different, you know. Like I, mm-hmm. like we all remember how controversial just the words "Black Lives Matter" were, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like that that was a thing, like that had to be debated, like "Black Lives Matter" or "All Lives Matter." Which one is it, you know? Like, what's the appropriate thing to say? What does this mean? Literal fights in the street. Literal fights in the street. You're right. People who were at the same protests. Yeah, I remember being in protests where, you know, there were chanting Black Lives Matter and then someone switches it to All Lives Matter. I remember the first time that it happened and I kind of like switched up to All Lives Matter. I was like, wait, no. You know, because like, <laughs> why do, what? You know, because in my head, I'm thinking, okay, you want to make sure that we're, you know, including Latinx people and Indigenous people. Okay, that sounds well intentioned until you're like, no, we need to talk about Black people shit. This is our turn. This yeah. is the whole point that we're talking about that specifically, right? This is so, why I came outside. So I came outside. <laughs> you know, I will come outside for you too. We can, you can have a day. Nobody's yeah. stopping you from having a day. We're going to come out on your day. You know, today's our day that we planned. Um, <laughs> I'm general in the house. I'm specific when I'm outside. I'm specific. (laughs) That's a very good way of putting it. I stepped out. I'm specific. I'm here for a reason. You know, I wore these shoes because Uh I know it's going to be walking. I didn't Um, wear all shoes. Right. I didn't wear, I didn't bring heels and flip flops and boots. I wore sneakers. (laughs) Particular shoes. No, but, um, but yeah, like there's a sense of optimism. There's a sense of the number of white folks in the street, you know, like I think back to that time in Ferguson, I think back to some of the, you know, the, the movements and marches and, and gatherings and protests that took place across the world, that they've been diverse. But this was the first time that you could see a lot of protests where black people were not there, you know, and because of the pandemic, I felt very confident saying like, look, um, maybe we don't need to be here. You know, <laughs> like maybe we can't all like it, this thing is hitting us hard. Like very quickly, we it went from ha ha black people can't get it to like, oh, shit, you know, like we are getting it and we are not. And so, yeah, maybe somebody else needs to, you know, put themselves on the line. And also, regardless of I don't care if it's 90 degree, you know, or if it's 75 and sunny or, or you know, storming, we have lined these streets with blood fighting for our freedom. Someone else has to it, it can't be us alone and it can't just be a handful of allies like this is white folks business at this point you know like we maybe need to set the terms for like what is freedom and liberation look like what do we want what are we owed but the discussion over whether we get it or not is you know a, a conversation between our demands and the people who are hearing them right and so the people who are hearing them fall into, you know, a number of factions. They're the people who are decidedly resistant. They're the people who have been, you know, passive in their resistance, you know, and in passive in their support of white supremacist patriarchy and how it's harmed us all. And there are people who have, you know, actively fought against it. And that last group has been mighty small. It's the reason we're still talking about John Brown all these years later, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's not been a better example since. <laughs> right? Like, so it, it's, but even with that, it's like, I feel, that I mean, we have watched, you know, a, a, a white man who, and I apologize when I remember his name, who was killed on a train defending, you know, a couple of black Muslim teenagers who were being harassed by an unhinged white supremacist. You know, I think of what it means to be a black woman being harassed in public by a black person or a white person or by anyone. And that feeling that nobody's going to step up for me. You know, and so that we're seeing people step up in that way is is certainly encouraging. So we've got a long fight ahead of us, but I do have a lot of optimism. Well, and I think it it challenges and complicates also then how people build the narrative about this past week, because for people who weren't participating at all, 
they still spent all summer watching white people also to some degree get their head beaten by the cops. It it helps complicate the like these are two sides and who's on the two sides and it's white people versus black people. It's like no no no, you're either fighting to protect white supremacy or you're fighting in counter of white supremacy and you can see what the consequences are on both sides. Um not that they're enacted equally, but I, I think that, that what happens when more people step in is that the like false narratives get easier and easier to challenge because yep. the evidence counters that. Yeah. Um, think about this, Ashley Babbitt being the first person to die in that insurrection, right? Like as a symbol of how white women have always been willing to put their bodies on the line in, in defense right. of white supremacy and have largely escaped. You know, we talk about uh, <laughs> yeah. white supremacy as the man, right? The man, right. the man is trying to get you. The man is holding me down. The white man that, uh, white women have largely escaped true accountability for how they have supported and sustained and benefited from white supremacist patriarchy. So we talk about them over indexing in, you know, are not over indexing, but like being the majority of the folks who uh, receive food stamp and, um, you know, benefits that we call welfare. Right. And benefits from affirmative action. Yeah, I was going to say and like affirmative action. Again. Right. Like but that these have not been foot soldiers to protect those movements. In fact, they have worked against, you know, like there's a stick there. We're all measuring our life outcomes by that. None of us, you know, outside of white cis hat, you know, able bodied very small group of white men gets to enjoy, right? All of the privileges and all the rights and all the freedoms. And the group that was right there, you know, coming in second somehow has imagined itself as the primary victim of sexism and while also being the, this foot soldier for something that, you know, like Dave Chappelle says, you might not have liked the, the hand you were dealt, but you participated, right? And so I think that white people needed to see everybody needs to see that right the participation of white women but too like white people needed to get their asses beat by the police white people needed to see that police represented their safety so they could pretend that the dog whistle or that the underlying message is that black people being free makes you unsafe right black people being able to come to your communities come to your job come to your kids school makes you unsafe so you need police to be armed and dangerous and ready to protect you from them and then the truth of policing being that one they are there to protect the property they are there to protect the interests of uh, those that are the wealthiest. And that is an extension of white supremacist patriarchal capitalism, right? That this was never just about um, black and white. It was never really about keeping most white folks safe either. It, it, it was about keeping this system safe and that they will sacrifice their own. We will kill, you know, a 18 year old white boy in a traffic stop because he had a little bit of weed in the car. That's happened. Right. We'll kill a, you know, blonde Australian woman for, for being mouthy with the cop. That's happened. Right. Like that you know, you too can be sacrificed for this. And if you dare to challenge it, we're going to whoop your ass too. So if this deal with the devil I made was that I need the police to keep me safe, and now I realize that that's not what they're invested in doing, I think for some people that was a, a real entry point into examining their own racial politics, you know? Absolutely. So it's that it doesn't have that. I, I was surprised that George Floyd's death was the one it pushed us to a point where the counter movement to that that led to what took place last week um, is being balanced by this energy. And also you have to think about the fact that we've been in the house for now, what, eight months, nine, nine months, months yeah. you Three, know, 302 days since I started. And we've been keeping a calendar, oh my God. which I never thought I'd be a motherfucker who kept a calendar, but I keep a calendar now. <laughs> I mean, 302 days. And so, and in that time, um, a lot of us have turned toward our spiritual practices, you know, have turned back toward kind of understanding what, you know, where we want to fall in the social order, what our values were. Like, we've had time to sit and think about these things. And I think that collective energy is, is present, right? That energy helps spurn those the, the people on the other side you know they're reacting to it they're feeling threatened by it as they should the world that tolerated that sort of hatred you know that sat at the dinner table with those people at, and at thanksgiving and didn't want to argue about it because it was just easier to talk about you know green bean casserole than it was to call out the fact that grandma's a straight up white nationalist monster you know um <laughs> 
Also, the casserole wasn't that good to begin with. There's no way the green bean casserole was good to begin with. It's made of something creamy and green beans with fried onions on top. Um, that's not going to do it. It's not going to do it. But um, that's where we are. Everything that I have engaged with has told me that this is going to be a year of, you know, radical change and change in terms of hearts and minds, um, that there is a sense of there's a shift happening in the world that's super palpable. I want to ask one last question off of that. Going back to your work, both for yourself and for the world as a writer, does that feel for you right now like a tool to make sense as the shift is happening? And are there things you're excited to figure out how to talk about in your writing that you haven't yet? Absolutely. You know, I think that at the, you know, if I, I look at that period of like, you know, 2018 to 2020, where there may have been things I want to respond to or grapple with that either maybe I wrote them and just kind of kept them to myself um, or, you know, wrote them for my book projects that I'm trying to put together or just kind of, you know, didn't feel like I could deliver or didn't have the energy or the, the attention span. Um, now I am flooding with material. Like I've got so many, you know, like my notes, app on my phone gets a lot of work. You know, like there's a lot of half-formed essays or beginnings of essays um, that I am putting together for something. I am uh, launching a newsletter in February. I'm feeling like I'm tapped into something where I'm hearing answers. You know what I mean? Like things that I might have had, you know, have been unsure about or how do I communicate this, where connections and things are just coming to me, you know, on a personal level, you know, about things about myself. Like, oh, this is why I've reacted this way to this sort of, you know, thing, or this is why I felt this way about that. But also in terms of, you know, these cultural conversations that we want to have, right? And so I think that this is a time for those of us who can make revolution irresistible to you know, be very intentional and deliberate about doing that work, because this is not about my gratification. This is about pushing uh, the world forward. And also just that I'm, how much I'm learning, like I'm reading more than I have um, in recent years. Like I, uh, I've returned to Tony and Zora and, and deeply familiar texts. Um, and I've, you know, in, been reading Adrian Marie Brown's Pleasure Activism, um, so even though her work is, you know, as an activist and organizer is different than, and writer is different than my own work in a lot of ways. And that this is a book about pleasure specifically, um, thinking ourse of ourselves as connected to something more than just oppression and white supremacy and patriarchy, right? That there is joy and abundance and, you know, all these really beautiful things to access in the world that we do access, um, no matter how pr uh, profound our struggle may be. But anyway, just engaging with those ideas and reading Bell Hooks's trilogy about love again, um, you know, just finding my own voice and, and what I think it should be in this moment by surrounding myself with, and 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 reminding myself, I should say, whose shoulders I stand on. Mm, that's beautiful. And I think we're both excited to see what comes as I move from reading to writing and sharing with the world. So last question that I got, it's the two-parter that we're asking through the whole suite. What's the best piece of writing advice you ever got? And what's the worst? The best piece, and I don't know where it came from, but just that like writers read don't get lost in your own thoughts. Don't get lost in the internet. You know, Twitter used to be called a microblog, right? A microblogging platform. And so those little 140 characters, 280 character thoughts can be powerful, and important. You know, um, I think a lot of us who have been pushed forward by somebody's, you know, great ideas that we might not be able to name or cite that we just came across, right? That little seedling that this person, this woman who may not be alive anymore, who may not be on social media anymore, right? Put some bug in my head that I took and, and you know, um, and we should name inside our sources when we can. But I mean, at times it's just literally just, it's just, you know, something got you thinking and you would not have recognized where it came from, but it, it landed. Uh, but the, the, with that, that like, read the people who influence the people who influence you. Mm -hmm. Right. So I can't just read bell hooks. I have to read who bell hooks read, you know, um, I think that 
our generation struggles with genealogy. Understanding your genealogy as a writer, like who do you come from? I I do feel that I am a descendant of Zora Neale Hurston in certain ways, even though our writing is very different and our racial politics are very different, you know, but I feel connected to her in this way. And so in, in me taking the time to uh, not just explore her writing, but the things that she read um, and, and the writers who've been deeply influenced by her. Uh, as far as the worst advice, I'd say it's the best advice and the worst advice all in one. I think Dream Hampton is the first person who I've heard say writers write. And, and my friend Miles Marshall Lewis uh, repeats it often, writers write. And so I think part of that was her pushing back from, you know, Dream stopped being a journalist a long time ago, has been a filmmaker and an activist and done other things, and yet was still, you know, thought of as Dream Hampton from the Source magazine or Dream Hampton who co-wrote De- Decoded. But that, you know, she was like, that's not what I'm doing. So stop calling me a writer. Writers write. You know, I'm doing other stuff. On one hand, I think it's sucky advice because you don't lose your identity as a writer because you're going through a period of depression or writer's block, right? You are still a writer. Um, But having the courage to just put down a sentence is really important. So if you're you're not in a place where you can write an essay or if you're someone who's written books and right now there's no book in you, if you typically write songs, you can't get a song out, you know, writing down a line, you know, writing a poem, just, you know, taking that little step to get back to your writer self, um, I think is one of the most important things that you can do. Mm. I wrote in my head every day for a long time. You know, I have all <laughs> these great ideas. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to write that down. And I did not feel okay until I got myself back to a place where I was going to actually do that. And it's like, well, what got you there? A big part of it was just simply writing the stuff down. It's taking that first step, you know? Um, some people hate writing and love having written. <laughs> um, I'm in the middle. I don't just, dis- I, I hate getting started, but the best thing you can do for yourself as a writer is to write one thing that I've done. Um, I keep post-its and, uh, note cards all over my house. Like in every room in my house now I have, you know, something to, so that way, if the moment, if, if there's a fleeting inspiration, if there's a thought, I write it down, you know, I don't lose it. But just however you can capture those thoughts when they hit you, because they hit you, right? Like you may have writer's block, you might not be inspired, but there, there's some, there's a line, there's, you know, an image, there's something you see, there's something you feel as a writer that is wanting to come out, let it out. Mm, beautiful. Dame, do you have anything before we wrap or you get to go? No, nah, I'm just I'm just grateful to have had you here with us and, and to, you know, that you shared your, your wisdom. Shout out to you as, as part of the extended tribe. I feel like a shout out to your pops again. Shout out to your daughter. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just, I'm just offering you love and, and appreciation for spending time with us. Well, I- how can go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just going to say I offer you both uh, love and appreciation for having me on the show. It means a lot to me. You know, I've admired, like I said, I've listened to the show before and Damon, you specifically, you know, you, your family and, and, and what you, the work that you all have done in Chicago, uh, your sister, your father, like I just, I, I'm very grateful for, for you all. Anytime somebody that I think of like, oh, this is like an actual organizer fucks with me. I feel very, (laughs) I feel very affirmed by it because I'm like, you get it. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not the ops, you know, like I'm not out here like dancing the videos, like just trying to, (laughs) you know, get rich off the movement. Like I'm really, (laughs) like, I'm really here. I'm with you. You know, my, my heart is here. And, you know, the second I got some wealth, I'm going to redistribute it. (laughs) <laughs> you sure. know for the people uh yeah. for, for the fight and you know I'm, I'm just i'm super grateful for you all having me so thank you it's a really of beautiful course. way to start off the year and a really nice conversation to have in the midst of such a deeply you know unique i should say i don't want to say straight just just a really unique time how can folks find you and your work in the ways you want to be found so i uh, thank you i like the way you say that that uh I have a personal website. It's jamilalemieux.com. Um, I will post the link to my newsletter there. You can keep up with me on social media uh, at Jamila Lemieux on Twitter and Instagram. I am a contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column um, on Fridays to answer parenting advice questions. Um, and I also am a co-host of Slate's parenting podcast, Mom and Dad Are Fighting. And I have a Slate Live show um, that 
is relaunching in uh, February. I was doing one on Thursday nights called The Kids Are Asleep, but we're coming back with a new name, new time, um, February 16th. So yeah, I guess I would just say just follow me on social media and I will begrudgingly share things there. I also have to work on, I hate prompt, like the beginning of my career is like, I have to share every link. I must beg people to click mm-hmm. on this or else, you know, my writing does not exist. And now it's like, I'm apologizing. Like, hi guys, I'm so sorry. I did something. I hope you'll look <laughs> at it. Please forgive me. You know, <laughs> So uh, relearning how to share my work on social media without feeling like an asshole for having work to do it all. Mm-hmm. That's Absolutely. Um, we're at Ergo Radio. I'm at Ergo Kiss. I'm at Damon underscore AF. And we will be back on the line next week, continuing our notebook suite, talking to the writers and thinkers reshaping our culture for the more equitable and creative. Much love to the people. Peace. <laughs>